scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast, this time discussing Project Avalon. I've got a very odd relationship with Project Avalon. This is, of course, part of the Summer of Blake 7. We're up to episode 9. Can you believe it? When we started all those weeks ago, the Summer of Blake 7. Well, we're way past halfway now. We're almost four stories from the end. Project Avalon. Well, this one was deemed so good by the BBC that they decided to release it as a novel. Not many of the novels were available, but this one was seen as particularly good. My relationship with this story is particularly not so good. Not because it is a bad story. It's not. Not because of the actors or even the appearance of the terrible security robot. No. My relationship is odd because I tend to watch Blake 7 late at night. And I have fallen asleep in Project Avalon about nine times over the last few months get to a point and I watch the duel all the way through and really enjoy it. Then I put Project Avalon on and then eventually I doze off and miss bits and then the lasers come and there's fighting and shouting and I go, oh, I wake up slightly and then stab at the remote and turn it off. And then the next time I come to watch it, I, I doze off again and I hadn't actually sat down and concentrated and watched all of this for some time, not since I'd seen it on VHS a very long time ago. So this time, for you, dear, dear listener, I decided to concentrate and watch it all the way through in one go and sort it. And I almost managed it. I did have to go off and do a few boring household chores. But that's not important. What is important is that Avalon really is good enough to deserve that novelisation. It's got Servalan in it. Goes up a point just for that. Not that I ever give marks out of ten for these things. So what's your basic plot? Your basic plot is one of, well, it takes place on Hoth. Yes, there is an argument out there that this whole story, you know, the rescuing of the princess, the running up and down the corridors, the villain in black, the Federation or Empire being the villains, has got a Star Wars Empire Strikes Back kind of feel. Yeah, it's arguable. It's rescue the princess. It's not really Star Wars. It's not really Empire Strikes Back. What it is, is itself. It's the everyday story of android folk. Or brainwashed folk. It would have been just as impressive to have some sort of hypnotised android, except, of course, that the end would have then been invalidated. So perhaps everyone was right in the first place. Project Avalon takes place in the ice world. Yeah, it's a bit Game of Thrones. The Northern Hemisphere had just entered its eight years of coldness. So perhaps Blake 7 Game of Thrones uh, fiction, fan fiction, is waiting to happen. And that for me would be hilarious. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Yes, but I know how to teleport through walls. Hmm. You do know that I've read all the books and still not seen a single episode of the TV programme. Apparently the TV programme has now overtaken the books, which is enough to make me weep. People have managed to sit through, what, 50, 60 hours of television? I sat through six months of Roy Detrice reading every single one of the books. Seven books. I know there's five books, but there's seven books. I wonder if he'll be doing the audio versions of the next ones. I do hope so. I've gone more off topic than you normally, so bear with me. This ice world... It doesn't look the most fun place, and it has a bunch of natives living there. Bizarrely, you either see them and they look human, and they've got ordinary weapons, or you don't see them ever, and they're all mining these incredibly pure crystals for the Federation. They need them for something or other, probably to do with a massive weapon. The Federation war was very big on their massive weapons. Travis has, of course, arranged some massively convoluted plan. The convoluted plan only exists because... 
Servalan has decided what she wants isn't just Blake dead. She wants the Liberator and all the gorgeous fluffy technology you have in there. And in all fairness, how Servalan dresses kind of matches what the Liberator looks like on the inside. She really does look like she should own the place. In the way that owners begin to look like their dogs, she already looks a bit like the Liberator. This is borderline weirdness, so moving on. Travis has, of course, captured Avalon. Avalon is a freedom fighter, and I'll use the rabbit ears, but you can decide for yourself whether she is or not. And as such, is obviously trouble for the Federation. She knows she's in trouble, and she needs help, so she's called for help. Weirdly, it's not Callie who's seen her before. It's Jenna. Callie, the person who's dealt with freedom fighters in the past, or Jenna, the space pirate. But she's the one who knows her. There are some very questionable knowing glances in this one. In the last story, there was a whole Jenna Callie knowing glance thing, which you could read far too much into, and I'm sure people have. But in this one, you've got Callie and Avon. Gans on board ship with them, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, Travis manages to orchestrate some sort of capturing of Avalon, because they know Blake's on the way, and Blake will want to rescue. Part of Travis's plan involves a strange bacterial thing that you break and it creates a massive pathogen and a chemical killing disease type thing that turns you into moss for no reason and then strips your flesh and kills you in about 23 seconds. Now, in programs like this, if a villain shows you the weapon being fired, launched and destroys someone, you know for a fact that at the end you won't get to see this happen because you've demonstrated the threat earlier. And you don't get to bore the audience by having the whole thing happen to everyone else. You know what the weapon does. You know it's powerful. So as a viewer, you're aware that this really isn't going to happen. It isn't going to kill everyone. If you think about it like that. But that's very predictable. That's very me. That's not very good at all. No, let's just suspend our disbelief and think everyone's in massive amounts of peril. Which they might be. They might. Travis is very good, like most of the villains in Doctor Who and in this at creating an overly complicated plot in order to capture someone. Avalon is, of course, made into a robot duplicate. We all know this. We've been watching it long enough. And she is used as a threatening device on board ship. Blake proceeds to try and rescue her, sneaking past the terrible security robot. I know I don't like talking about it either, but that's just the way things are. I do hope the security robot gets retired quite soon. He's showing the whole place up for what it is. But if you spend almost 17 quid on a robot, you've got to have it on screen, haven't you? I imagine it was actually very, very expensive as a prop. But you can't really tell. Security robots are notoriously difficult to build ones that look efficient or threatening or anything. The scariest robots of all time have been Terminators and the things out of the Matrix. And that, wandering down the corridor, would have been scary. Here, no. It looks like you could push it over. Plot-wise, yes, you know they try and rescue Avalon and Avalon really isn't herself. And then they go back down and they threaten and have a lovely standoff. And eventually, Travis is stripped of his command. Servalan is cowardness personified. She's actually more scared of things than Villa. But she is a politician. A politician with ideas above a station, perhaps. But she wants to be president. Or perhaps even a commissioner one day. Or is that the other way around? Either way, that's for the future. Avalon is a superior story. It's one of the ones you could actually show someone if you were trying to impress them. But you also needed to make sure that they could get past the dodgy effects of the inside of Avalon's head and the very, very dodgy robot. Apart from that, of course it's fine. I'd like to know why the teleporter didn't register the fact that she isn't a real person. She isn't a biological entity. And that she is, well, a machine. In Star Trek, that would have registered and shown up on some sort of lists. But here, it's a lot more free-flowing. So yeah, there's holes in the plot, but there always are. It's episode 9 of 13. And until next time, when we might be covering some Doctor Who, but probably some more Summer of Blake 7, be seeing you. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast, available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. 
You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise, or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. On the 5th of September 2015, Hooverville will return. The biggest little Doctor Who convention in the whole of the UK is proud to present several fantastic guests. First off is THE Colin Baker, a man who needs absolutely no introduction. Guests also include the author Jenny Colgan, responsible for Dark Horizons and Time Trips, Richard Marson, the man behind JNT, The Life and Scandalous Times, and the brand new book Drama and Delight, the biography of Verity Lambert, Dan Starkey, the man behind the mask when it comes to Commander Strax, and of course Ian the Elf in the Christmas special. Terence Dix, one of the men behind The Third Doctor and more target novelizations than you can shake a stick at. The actor David Benson, from Robot of Sherwood, Iris Wildheim and The Scarifiers. Matthew Waterhouse, yes, Adrake. Michael Pickwood, the current production manager on Doctor Who. And Karen Louise Hollis, author of The Man Behind the Master, the biography of Anthony Inley. More guests may be added but either way, that's a fantastic lineup. Visit the Derby Quad website on www.derbyquad.co.uk and follow the links. Saturday, the 5th of September 2015. See you there. Mr. Nida.